This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. This video goes through question 3 of the June 2010 F8 International Examination. Section A, very short, asking us to define test of control and substantive procedures and then state one test of control and one substantive procedure in relation to sales invoicing. Note in the definitions that you wouldn't have to give an example there. That's handled in A2. So first of all, a test of control. The purpose of a test of control or a test of control is to examine the effectiveness or the operation of controls that have been established by management uh, that are there to uh, detect uh, or to prevent uh, and then if detected to correct any material misstatements. A substantive procedure, a substantive procedure does not look at controls, it looks at uh, the financial statements at the assertion level uh, which means that you look at a figure on the financial statements and you think, how can I test that this is correct? What sort of procedures can I adopt? And the two sorts of procedures which are available under the heading of substantive procedures are tests of details and substantive uh, analytical procedures. So the definition would be something like substantive procedures are aimed at detecting material misstatements at the assertion level. Substantive procedures can comprise tests of detail of uh, balances and transactions uh, and also they can consist of analytical procedures. A2 asks you to state one test of control and one substantive procedure in relation to sales invoicing. Uh, and this should be very uh, easy. Remember, however, if you're describing a test of control, make sure you are looking at controls. And a, a simple one would be uh, imagining a system where invoices have to be authorised or uh, in some way verified before they are sent out. So a potential test of control there is looking at a sample of invoices for evidence of authorization by uh, a responsible official. Uh, for example, of any discounts given or that someone has ensured that the invoice uh, is complying with the credit control restrictions or in manual systems uh, maybe evidence that somebody has re-performed the calculations on the invoice but you're looking for evidence that the control has been operating a substantive procedure an easy one for example would be to look at the month-by-month -month invoices and look for any abnormal or kind of unseasonal variations on the value of the invoices which were issued during that month. Part B. Look at the requirements first. It says for the cash cycle of SHW, identify and explain three deficiencies in the system. So it'll be one mark per deficiency. Suggest controls to address each of these deficiencies. Again, one mark for each. And list the tests of control you could perform to assess if the controls are operating effectively. Again, one mark each. And this uh, question is really crying out for a columnar approach. A one column identifying the uh, deficiencies, next to that how you would correct those, and then the final column would be how you would test the controls are actually operating. And it says for the cash cycle here, and in this question uh, it says very definitely the cash receive cycle is as follows. Uh, there are I think some, some problems up here uh, in the system of internal control uh, for example, how do we know how many customers a window cleaner goes to? How do we know that the window cleaner isn't beginning to um, operate uh, 
his own kind of little business within the business of HHW. But the question is, is, is very much focused on the cash received cycle. And there are four little paragraphs here. And usually when you have these four little bits of detail, you'd expect at least one problem or one relevant thing to say arising from each of those. So here we have a junior clerk from the accounts department opens the post and if any checks or cash have been sent, she records receipts in a cash received log and then places all the monies in a locked small cash box. First thing uh, that uh, you should be thinking about is whenever the examiner gives any sort of uh, detail uh, here and we have uh, the detail of a small cash box. A small cash box uh, implies that it might be easily portable uh, and therefore easily stolen. So there's only a deficiency in, in, in that, that we have the monies put in a, in, in a rather unsecure small cash box. Uh, the way to fix that would be to buy uh, some sort of safe in which the money could be uh, lodged overnight. And the way in which you would uh, test the control is presumably by observing the money coming in uh, and uh, seeing that it was indeed locked away in the safe at night, making it much more secure. There's uh, another issue uh, here. Uh, in so far, not so much that the person is a junior uh, clerk, but there's a, there is an element of perhaps being a not a responsible official there. Uh, but it, it, there's one person opening the post with all of this cash coming in, uh, and this, of course, uh, easily gives rise to uh, uh, methods whereby this po this person could pocket some of the money. And the the normal way to, to deal with this is if cash is coming through the post, and it's rather unusual nowadays, but to cash or checks, is to have two people opening the post and one watches the other one so that there will only be theft if the two people collude. So, so again, you could advise two people open a post. Uh, the sort of uh, would be the, the control to address that deficiency. Uh, and again, the way you would test that that controller is operating is to watch people opening the post in a couple of days and making sure that there are two people at least doing that. The contents of the cash box are counted each day and every few days these sums are banked by whichever member of the finance team is available. Uh, and I would say every two days is probably not uh, correct. What do they mean by every uh, few days? Do they mean every two, every three, or every five, or every ten? Um, yeah, uh, and even uh, for a number of days, the amount of cash could be mounting up to substantial sums uh, here. So the deficiency is uh, that we're not banking the money uh, promptly. Uh, the uh, way to uh, address that deficiency is to say all monies and checks should be banked every day and the way you would test that is to look at the stamps on the pay-in books uh, to look maybe at the bank statements which shows amounts of money coming in every day by whichever member of the finance team is available uh, it implies that if something had gone wrong, it might be very difficult to, to trace back and to discover who was responsible for banking the amount that day. It seems to be a rather random process. And it would be much better if, if there was a, an allocated team member uh, whose responsibility it was uh, to do this. We could observe that person uh, doing it as, as, as part of the test. The cashier records details of cash received log in the cash receipts daybook and also updates the sales ledger. Uh, perhaps the deficiency here uh, isn't quite as uh, obvious, uh, but cashiers uh, are normally expected to look after cash and somebody in the uh, receivables department should be looking after the sales ledger really. Here we have one person doing both the debits and the credits. And generally speaking, one person doing the debit and the credit of one transaction is evidence that we maybe don't do very good segregation of duties. So really, one person uh, ought to be doing 
the updating of the cash book, a separate person ought to be doing the credit of the receivables ledger. Uh, the way we can test that is that, we, again, we can uh, watch uh, people doing that, uh, see who has access to various ledgers, uh, and to, to make sure that there's proper segregation of duties being followed. Final point, usually on the monthly basis, again, rather casual, uh, the cashier performs a bank reconciliation, which he then files. Uh, the, the implication is he could file it even if the bank reconciliation didn't work very well. And if he just happens to miss a month, well, never mind, we can catch up on that uh, in the following month's reconciliation. Far too casual. Bank reconciliations should be done monthly, uh, and they should then be uh, signed or authorized or verified by a responsible official. Uh, and the way we would test that those controls were both there is we would want to see monthly reconciliations and we would want to see the signature of the responsible official evidencing the fact that uh, the reconciliations were checked by that responsible official. A really easy question if you, 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 you take your time, make sure you address all three requirements. Uh, but there is a tremendous amount within the question uh, which will easily generate at least three deficiencies and once they are identified, generally correcting them and thinking about a test is pretty easy. Part C for seven marks ask you to describe substantive procedures an auditor would perform in verifying the company's bank balance. And presumably there would be seven procedures required to, to get the seven marks. Remember, substantive procedures, you're looking at things such as valuation, existence, ownership, uh, perhaps accuracy, because substantive procedures uh, kind of try to verify balances at the assertion level. So you need or can use procedures which attack any of the relevant assertions. First of all, uh, we should agree the cash balance in the financial statements to the cash book. That doesn't sound very clever, but the financial statement sh should be agreeing with the books of account, basically. How do we know that the uh, cash balance uh, and therefore the cash book might be showing the right amounts? Uh, this will not necessarily be the amount which is uh, shown in bank statements and uh, almost always there's going to be a need for a bank reconciliation. So there'll be a discrepancy between what the bank says is cash and what the company says is cash. So we need to make sure that, that uh, difference, those differences are properly explained. So we need to agree the bank reconciliation amounts to the cash book and the year-end bank balance for the bank statement. In other words, uh, if you like, the beginning and end point of the bank reconciliations need to be verified. And then we need to reperform the bank reconciliation. Uh, we need to make sure that any uncredited lodgements are indeed uncredited, any unpresented checks are indeed uh, uncredited. And in particular, we need to make sure that the reconciliation, the, uh, the arithmetic within it is correct. Somebody hasn't just fiddled it. We should also agree the bank reconciliation. Uh, in other words, the uh, amount that we say is in the bank, or the bank says in the bank, to the certificate that we should always receive from a bank. We've got two external sources of evidence. We have the bank statement, and then we, you always get a special bank certificate where the bank writes to the auditors saying uh, what the balances are and indeed what uh, maybe certain securities are and, uh, and so on. Any uncredited amounts that have been paid in, in other words, uh, the company says it's maybe paid in uh, $10,000, on the 28th of December, we have to make sure that that really does uh, appear at some point in the bank account. Because what the company might be doing is essentially debiting cash 10,000, crediting receivables 10,000 to reduce receivables, to increase the cash, to avoid maybe any difficulty about bad and doubtful debts. 
we need to see that amount of money coming in. Similarly, any unpresented payments that are outstanding at year end, we ought to see those going out of the banker's statement later. So we should trace unpresented payments to subsequent appearance on the bank statements. Generally, when a bank writes to the auditors with the bank certificate, it will list all the accounts uh, that the company holds with them, and it will also list an information about any securities, any, for example, share certificates that they may be holding on behalf of the company, and any security which they have, uh, say, uh, a mortgage on the company's properties. Just dealing with uh, the bank balances, we would obviously not be too pleased if on the financial statements it showed us uh, cash in hand, uh, but didn't show us an overdraft. So we need to make sure that every balance that the the bank has with respect to our client is properly reflected in the trial balance and then the financial statements. If something hasn't been left out. Uh, finally, and this is probably the eighth one, we're getting an extra one here, we should review cash movements just before and just after year end. In particular, any large ones any material movements just before just after year end. Uh, again, there, there may be evidence of window dressing. We could have an amount uh, that a company has uh, debited to the cash book just before year end, and then maybe that is reversed after year end, again, to make the transactions look better. So all material movements just before just after year end uh, should be inquired into to make sure that they are indeed genuine.